Welcome to Plan Stronger TV. I'm your host, David Holland. I'm glad you stopped by because we need to talk about small businesses and their owners. I'm joined on today's program by author and business planning expert, Randy Long, to discuss the specific steps that business owners can take to make the most of their businesses for themselves, for their families, for their employees, and for their clients. I'll also address the important topic of how to pay for long-term care if you need it. Let's roll. And welcome to the program for another discussion of business planning. Now, business succession planning affects all of us because, as we've talked about on the program before, small businesses drive this country. And I'm very excited to have Randy Long back on the program with us. Randy, welcome back. Good to be here again. All right, friend. excellent. You know, if you know that they come back to the program, they're really good. <laughs> so, uh, Randy has a firm, Long Business Advisors, and you're in North Carolina and California. We are. And you do a lot of work with business owners and helping them prepare for transitioning that business if it's today or down the road. That's correct. Excellent. And you've uh, also written the book, uh, The Braveheart Exit. Yes, I did. And so tell me about the book. The book was written um, primarily to help the small market. Um, you know, too often um, a business owner's career comes to an end and we want them to make sure that they get value for the business at mm -hmm. the end of their career. So. Um, the book is a way for them to get the information relatively cheaply and put it into practice and you know, build a team around themselves and that sort of thing because mm. sometimes the smaller business guys can't afford you know, 12 lawyers and 15 accountants and all that. But for them, for the small, your typical small business owner, a high percentage of their net worth and what they're going to have to draw on for their retirement is that business. That's right. It's typically 70 to 90 percent of the value, so it's a really big deal. And it's important why, um, it's, it's the important reason why we have to get this right. They can't afford not to do it well. So a lot of what you do is you're consulting with the business owner and, and helping them understand the different things that they need to do to sell their business and to sell it well. The, that's correct. Or, right. to, or to transition it to the next generation. What, what, what percentage go each way? You know, it's about probably 40% or so will go to the next generation of the ones we work with, that's our experience, and about 60% will ultimately sell. Hmm. Do you think you get a disproportionate number that want to keep it in the business so they come to you and hire a consultant versus somebody that sells it? Probably, because we have a, we have a little bit of a bias towards wanting to keep the, the business in the family right. because we can leverage that generation capital and, and it gives the kids a leg up on starting a successful business and just taking one over is a lot more successful typically than starting one over again with new ideas and new markets. Well, and, and Randy knows this and the, the audience does by this point. I started my own company in 97 and it's been a, a wonderful journey. It hasn't been easy. Mm -hmm. and, but being an entrepreneur, you know, it, it, I, would, I wouldn't wish it on anybody else, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. No way. It's an interesting journey. It, it's the freedom side of life that we love. Well, know? no caps. Uh, but you are responsible. So, all right, so let's dig in. So with um, business owners out there looking to um, build their business, would you say that it is a, a similar or maybe the same path of trying to maximize the value of your business for yourself in terms of what it can give you? Is that also the same path of making it worth more to somebody else? Uh, yes, sort of. Okay. Um, I'll deal with this uh, early on here because there are, there's a decision tree that a business owner makes. And that, that question comes up is to whom do you want to transition, when do you want to transition, and how much do you need from it? Well, the question about who you're going to transition or sell to changes the way we build and work on that transaction. Okay. So as an example, if I'm going to sell to an employee, my goal is actually to make the company worth less money. Mm. Um, it isn't that I want to get less to the business owner. 
it's that through the actual sale itself, I mm. want it to, mi to be minimized so I can save taxes on it. So we'll extract value to the owner in different ways. I see. As opposed to if I'm going to sell to a third party, then of course my goal is to build the business in such a way that I maximize the revenue from the sale. Okay. So building and, and thinking about what is going to be the end game, this requires a different mindset for the, the, the business owner who has been so focused on you know, customers and, and services and cash flow and, and employees and personnel and, and insurance and all of these things, they've got to change their mindset. Yeah, they do. So if you're a business owner, just think about this with me for a moment. If you're a business owner and you have, um, you've, got to, you've got to sell the business, that's your goal here anyway, you've got to start to put glasses on, you need to look through the lens, if you will, of a buyer. You need to start thinking about how is a buyer going to view my company. Mm. And so that's different than how a, uh, an employee views it, it's different how I view it, and it's different how my customers or my clients view it. So you've got to reorient yourself and start looking at it through the eyes of a buyer. Because a buyer is going to look for reasons not to buy it, and also reasons to buy it. Mm. And so what we want to do as part of our, our work in this whole process is, is minimizing the things that are going to be considered risk and maximizing the things that are going to be considered opportunity. So the, the seller has to, uh, or the owner who wants to be a seller, has to yeah. embrace some of that, that, that thinking from the buyer's perspective. Now, you already kind of touched on this, but it will expand on it just for one second, and that is that you also need to be thinking about what's the best buyer for your business and what your goals are. Because yes. that's going to affect the mindset you take on, which will be different depending on who it is. That's right. And that's why that first, the, we call that, that first part the decisions, if you will. So deciding whether it's going to, to go to an employee or a third party or a child changes pretty much everything, honestly. Mm. Um, the way you structure it, who you're looking for, if you're going to third parties, what markets. Um, and if we're going to if we're going to be involved in this, we like to see our business owners, and if the business is large enough, typically five million or so and above, we love to see our companies sold with a with an auction process. It's called a controlled auction. Mm. And so if you're going to do it well, as I said, and if you've never heard that term, by the way, then you clearly should not be doing this by yourself. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, if I was going to buy a business, I would love to get a hold of you before you get to any real competent um, counsel because then I can make sure I get a better deal versus mm -hmm. you because we talked about before about that 1% solution. Um, people that pay for professional help typically do much, much, much better than those who disdain it. Mm. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. Well, I think part of that has to be that, that you're getting um, perspective that you don't have. Again, because you can't see the, the forest when you're staring not just at the tree, but your nose is up to the part That's right. of the tree. I mean, you're right there. How can you look at this from the outside? Right. And part of our process, just to that point, too, is the idea that we need to extricate our business owner from working in the business on a day-to-day -day basis. We want the business owner to eventually work on the business, not in it. And a business owner that works on it will sell a business at a higher multiple than mm. one who is needed day to day, for sure. Well, I can say just from my own personal experience, you know, part of what I do is that business owner capacity and thinking about and on and working on my business. Right. And then I'm in the business because right. I have a role that I, I am taking in working with clients and working with my team. So, but from the outside looking in, somebody looking to buy my business is not for sale. I like what I do, <laughs> and I plan on doing it for a long time. But for somebody looking at a business like mine, they're going to say, all right, well, what is David doing? Yeah. Well, listen, you're doing it wisely, frankly. So the, you can't get scale. You can't get growth if you become the the place where, what do you call it, uh, when, you, when you can't get past that person? Linchpin you're, you're or the bottleneck? Lin yeah, you're the bottleneck. Yeah. Thank you. If you're the bottleneck, the company will never grow past you. So you've got to get yourself out of the way so that, so that a next level management team can leverage itself and leverage its skills and everybody else mm -hmm. and grow that company past where you could have ever hoped. Maybe I need to take more vacation. You, maybe you do. <laughs> okay, so you talked about um, uh, the team. I, I think that's probably a critical thing to focus on a little bit, Randy, and that is what kind of team does somebody need and when do they need it if they're thinking about not only building their business but selling it at some specific time frame or, or, or time in their life? Right, so we're going we're gonna to build two teams. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, the first team we're going to build is actually the exit planning team. And that will consist of 
anywhere from two or three people up to nine or ten, depending wow. on how big and how complicated things are. And, and also, every business that we work with is all different. They all, when we come in, they all have different needs. Mm. Everything's unique. But essentially, the team to, to transition the company, if you will, to prepare it, is a, you, know, you need a good estate planning lawyer. Mm -hmm. You need a good business lawyer. You need a good um, CPA and a planning CPA, not one j that just reports but actually plans with us. We need valuations people. We need property casualty people. We need wealth management mm. people. We, you know, we need a, a slew of people. And we also need to be real careful that as your business is growing through, one of the things we do is vet professionals for our clients. Mm. And sometimes they have outgrown the market in which they oh. worked with their, with their client before. Mm. So you know, sometimes we have to tell them, you, you have moved past the market in which these people typically practice. We need you. to find somebody else for you to get us to the next level. We know he's your golfing buddy, but right. we need somebody that is at a higher level for what you're trying to achieve. That's correct. So that's mm. the one team. The other team is the team that we'll build when it's time to go to market. And that is going to, so a lot of times people refer to us as pre-M&A or pre-mergers and acquisitions work. And when we get to the point where we're ready to sell, though, we will we'll hire an M&A firm. We'll hire the deal lawyers. Mm. You know, we'll, we'll put the people in place to make that team you know, because there's work to do um, to get the ready for to get the company ready for sale after we've made it profitable. Mm -hmm. Then we also have some some readjustments, if you will, to books and things like that to get it ready to actually take and to do some like um, you know legal work and some accounting sure. work that makes it clean. So team to prepare it, team to sell it. That's correct. Now here's a big one for business owners out there, especially who are listening to us talk, Randy. There's something screaming in their head right now confidentiality and privacy. Definitely. If people find out you're going to sell the business, business or owners are very paranoid about the news getting out, even if it's three years down the road. Right. So I've worked with families for, um, you know, seven to 12 years. It, it's part of what we do is it's business consulting. You know, yeah. it isn't just preparing for a sale. All the things that we would do for you to help you grow your business and to, to deal your, do your estate planning, get everything in order mm -hmm. just in case, because tragedy may take you out. I Absolutely. don't know your exit. We may plan for your exit a certain way, but, but you might have a heart attack and die. And so we have to plan for all these things. And I've had a number of, of cases like that. One of those cases we had, we were, we were sh uh, almost finished with transitioning to a kid in his 40s. And he came down with cancer and was dead in four months and four weeks. Wow. So our backup plan kicked in, and we ended up selling to a key employee. But the business owner was ready to be out. Wow. Right? We prepared him for all of that. So that contingency planning is part of this whole piece too. Sure. It can be complicated, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that through, and that's a lot. Well, but. When you think about the things that business owners need to be do, doing along in this process, yeah. um, we need to think about how to make the business, and I think the term you use is more durable, business yeah. durability. Business durability. So there's two takes on business durability. One of them is making the business durable just while the business owner is alive. And sure. that's the idea of you know, making sure that um, you know, you have adequate property casualty, as an example, both inside the business and outside. Sure. Because if you run a red light and kill me, or if your wife does, let's say, she runs a red light and kills me and my wife sues your wife or you, uh, my wife's going to end up, she might end up with all of your company because right. it, it, your property casualty for the company doesn't kick in there. It's the personal. Sure. And we've seen business owners make huge mistakes in that where they've got huge amounts of property casualty on the business side and almost none on the personal side. Really? So there's consistency in all this stuff that you have mm -hmm. to find. So um, what was that? What was durability. Your, I yeah, mean, durability. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the durability piece is during, during the business owner's life. So there's a let's survive, let's grow, that durability piece. Right, right. And that can be EPLI insurances. There's a lot of pieces that play into this. Mm. The other part of this is durability on a generational level. And that's durability not just for the business but for the family. And as I, I, I keep trying to pull this back to, we, when we're doing our planning, we're doing the planning for the business and the family to make them understand how the business is going to impact the family and get the family ready for a sale or get the, get the family ready for a transition. And how are they going to deal with, um, what, what are they going to do when the business is sold? Because we don't want to create a family of trust babies and everybody's you know, um, unemployed and lounging around because the family goes to hell in a handbasket, they typically end up in litigation anyway and waste it all. <laughs> it's true. Well, actually, I've told my mom and dad, they can make me a trust baby if they want. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
You spoke to something, though, I think that's a very interesting point, Randy, and it is that there are stakeholders. There are. There are participants here that have a, a sincere interest in the business being, being transitioned successfully. Definitely. Employees, vendors, customers, family. Other shareholders. Other shareholders. Mm -hmm. Everybody. So, and I know that's part of why you do what you do because right. you, you need to consider all of that. To, and again, it's all about achieving those results, but also maximizing value. Right, so I am a lawyer, as, as you mentioned before. So one of the things I am as a lawyer, I've done uh, you know, 25 years of estate planning and business transactional work. But, but in, in exit planning work, um, a lawyer has to have a client. And if I'm gonna work in a in a exit plan where there's three or four stakeholders or kids or whatever it is, shareholders, et cetera, we like to come in and when I'm the consultant, I don't have to choose a client. Right. The business pays me, but ultimately we we put ourselves into each person's seat and try to consider for ourselves what would we want if we were them. And we interview them and we try so we try to negotiate something that works well for the whole family. Mm. Sometimes we don't negotiate, we just advise that certain kids should be cut out because they're going to destroy the business, they're wow. going to litigate, they're going, you know, all these things. So it doesn't mean we want them cut out of an inheritance, but just not necessarily running the business. That's pretty pointed. Definitely. I mean, pointed. that's pretty. That's uh, you surprised me, Randy, because I think the natural uh, assumption is that when you're trying to work this out, you're trying to work it out for everybody who wants to be involved. But again, to get that the value of the business, the highest can be for and be the best for as many people as it can. That's correct. You've got to sometimes cut somebody out of the process. That's right. Sometimes there's a kid or mm -hmm. an employee. I mean, wow. we had a we're we have a firm in California. We we happen to work like from all over the country. We have cases in Denver and uh, Dallas, all over. So, but we had a case that we were working on recently where um, we had to cut out you know, a kid and we actually had the parents fire the kid from the business because he was what? destroying the business from the inside. <laughs> You know, he was undermining everyone and everything, and he wow. just had a bitter, you know, bitter spirit. So I'd love to see you at Christmas, but not in the office. Yeah, and eventually, wow. you know, eventually the kid apologized and said his parents made the right call. Sometimes tough love is necessary. Mm. That's fascinating. It is. I mean, so so when you look at trying to address all those stakeholders, as I called them, mm -hmm. um, you're going to then craft for the business and guide them on how to move this forward and make the right transition. That's correct, that's correct. That's fascinating. It is fascinating, and it, the reason I love it is because every one of them is so different. You know, it's like people ask me, oh, do you specialize in you know, manufacturing, or do you specialize in agriculture, or do you, no, 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 I, I really don't. Um, you know, we sold a, um, we prepared and sold a SaaS company recently, that's, you know, software as a service. It was a medical company, so, Everything from that to you know large agricultural concerns. So it's not so much the industry; it's more. It's a function, the process. The process. I was going to say you're dealing with humans on all these. We are. <laughs> oh, they're all people. They are people. And they don't. They're not as compliant as robots, right? <laughs> they are not. Um, it's not all ones and zeros. Um, it is not. So well, I, I tell you, I, I appreciate your being able to come and share with Randy because it is such a a critical thing, and I, of course, being an entrepreneur, have a, a keen interest and understanding and appreciation for what you do yes. because it does take a brave heart. It does take a brave heart to not only run a business but then to be thinking ahead on transitioning that business. So I applaud you for what you're doing and, and glad you could share with me and with the audience. Yes, sir. Love the time. All right. Thank you very much, Randy. Good to have you with us. It's good to be here. All right. Okay, it's time for the scoop. This is a segment of the program where I dig a little deeper into a particular subject, and I hope it helps you with understanding some additional information. So let's dig right in. Today's topic is long-term care. How do you pay for it? Boy, it's a challenging subject, so I'm going to give you a lot of statistics, and then we'll dig into some of the different strategies that you can use to pay for long-term care. So I've got a little box I'm going to put over to my left that will hold all these statistics, ready? And these are courtesy of Morningstar and the Alzheimer's Association. So here we go. 80% of women are unmarried when they die. 70% of Americans over 65 will need some form of long-term care during their lifetime. The reason for that is 70% of Americans over 65 will become cognitively impaired 
or unable to complete at least two activities of daily living, like getting dressed, going to the restroom by yourself, eating, not being able to do those things. Next, 60% of women over 65 won't just need some basic, but extensive long-term care. Extensive will equal expensive. 40% of Americans over 65 will enter a nursing home. 40% of those receiving long-term care are under 65. That's not a typo. 40% of people receiving long-term care are actually under 65. 20% of nursing home residents stay for at least five years, and 60% of residents never leave the nursing home. Now for some dollars. $73,000 is the average annual cost of a nursing home. Average life expectancy after an Alzheimer diagnosis is eight to 10 years. Now, Medicare. Medicare only covers if you have 100, you have up to 100 days that Medicare will cover, but it's only if you are in a hospital three days prior. And Medicaid. Medicaid is only for people who have run out of assets. In other words, you're broke. So it's a lot of information, but the, the key point, which I'm sure you can see, is that long-term care is a big deal. It's expensive. It's especially an important subject for women because a lot of them will end up being alone in terms of not being married, single, divorced, widowed. So they need to take extra steps. Some of the ways to do that are to consider different options that include Medicare, Medicaid, and other types of insurance. So we're going to dig into those, but the most important thing I want you to know before we get into the details is that all of the options I'm going to give you are options, and they may or may not fit for a particular person or their situation. So it's really going to be individualized. So let's dig in to the specific options. All right, first, Medicaid. Medicaid is for people who are poor, who don't have any more assets. Qualify for Medicaid, it is a federal program administered by the individual states. To qualify for Medicaid, you've got to be broke. And you really should be broke for real. And I say that to mean there are some um, financial strategies or techniques that sometimes are used to qualify for Medicaid when you aren't really broke. So, you know, that's kind of a, a moral or ethical question. My opinion is Medicaid is there as a safety net. It is a backup plan that we as a country, we have, as taxpayers, have agreed to support people who are in a real pickle. All right, so that's option one, which is really kind of should be your last option, not your first option. Second is your family. Family, meaning uh, children, siblings, spouse, being able to get care in your home. A lot of care for somebody who needs long-term care or some of those activities of daily living I mentioned, not being able to bathe yourself, dress yourself, get in out, out of a car, whatever the case may be, that is a lot of times done by family. So, and also bringing somebody in to do some of the more maybe medically related care that's needed and done in the home. The next option, which a lot of time and energy is spent on this by the financial industry, is long-term care insurance. Now, there's different types of long-term care insurance. There's the traditional, where you pay your premium every year and you have coverage. And there's also what's called asset-based long-term care insurance. That's where you put a lump sum of money down and then you have a policy. And typically, it's a longer-term policy. And these different types of insurance policies have their advantages and disadvantages, but that's one of the ways to deal with it and address it. Now, here's a couple that aren't as well known or thought of. Using a reverse mortgage to pay for long-term care. Maybe you establish a line of credit that's a reverse mortgage line of credit, and you let that be there and available, and then when the time comes that you need to pay for care, you can pull on it as a line of credit and don't have to pay it back right away, okay? In fact, you never have to pay it back. You can just let that loan sit out there and accrue. The other thing is to arrange your assets with a trust so that somebody else can step in and pay for your care out of the assets you have. You don't have to have insurance. The key thing is to consider all these different options 
and find the right solution for your individual situation. And if you do that, you know what I'm going to say, you'll plan stronger. If you would like more information about the topics and our guests featured in this series, please visit our website at planstrongertv.com. Also, if you have a question you would like David to answer, please send it to questions at planstrongertv.com.